Thanks, Nico. So, well, as Nico has explained, I mean, my background and the organization I work for, the Endangered Landscapes Program, I think it's okay. I think I'm just being cautious and holding this some distance away. Um, it's an environmental conservation project. Um, and it's, well, I mean, I imagine most of us don't really need to be told that we have an environmental crisis, but a lot of people, I think, think that the environmental crisis is taking place somewhere else, not here in, in Europe. But actually, when you look at the, the statistics, the facts and the figures, um, the loss in, of biodiversity um, in Europe is, is dramatic um, and alarming. So the European Environmental um, Agency has shown that 81% of Europe's habitats are in a, a poor condition. Um, we've lost 600 million birds across Europe um, in the last four decades. Um, in Belgium, 20 butterfly species that used to live here in Belgium no longer exist. And populations of but butterflies have, have decreased by 30%. And I could go on to talk about loss and decline across Europe. So it's really, really serious. So it's got so serious that there's a need not just to conserve what we've got left, but really to start thinking about restoring biodiversity um, globally and within Europe. Unfortunately, the world is waking up to this. So the next 10 years have been designated as the United Nations Decade on Restoration, and the European uh, Union is currently debating a new law on nature restoration, which is going through the European Council at the moment. This is a really important law for the future of the environment and biodiversity within Europe. So that's the positive side. So you're probably wondering what on earth I'm um, talking about biodiversity for in a meeting which is all about really culture um, and uh, economy. The reason I think um, is very clear when you look about around this room and when you see some of Nico's work, which is the connection between culture um, and the environment and biodiversity. So, I mean, we can ask ourselves, you know, how can, for example, a poem or a song about the cuckoo survive or be taught to children if they've never heard a cuckoo, if they've never seen a cuckoo? How can people be expected to continue a tradition of embroidering flowers and plants on clothes if those flowers and plants are no longer available to inspire them? How can traditional cooking survive if it depends on herbs that people used to collect from the forest or the fields if those herbs are no longer available? So I think in so many ways we can see that our culture and our traditions are based around environment and nature. And therefore, loss of that nature, loss of those species is a loss not just for the environment, but it's a it's a loss for culture as well and tradition. And those are really, really important connections to make. And therefore, any action for the environment, any action for biodiversity is an action for tradition um, and culture and livelihoods as well. So the Endangered Landscapes Programme is really a response to that. Um, it aims to restore landscapes across Europe. Um, and one of the landscapes where it's working is the Carpathian Mountains, the Fagarash part of the Carpathian Mountains in Romania. Um, and this is, you know, an extraordinary area. Um, you'll have seen some of the, 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 the slides, the pictures um, from, from Nico's film. Uh, some of the highest mountains um, in, the, in the Carpathian chain, still big populations of charismatic uh, species like bear and wolf, um, red deer, um, and some of the largest areas of old growth um, forest across all of Europe, beautiful, beautiful forests. But it's also suffered loss and degradation as well. Um, terrible deforestation in some areas um, and some species that were hunted to extinction many, many years ago, species like bison and beaver. So the project we've been supporting um, in that area has been restoring those ecosystems through replanting uh, the forests that have been destroyed and reintroducing some of those missing species. So they've been reintroducing bison in areas that they haven't existed for 200 years, similarly reintroducing beaver as well. But these kind of changes, reintroducing those species and restoring um, the environment and biodiversity is really 
um, something that is 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 quite dramatic for the for people that live there. This is their home. Um, this is where they make their livelihoods. Um, and restoration of this kind can, and we hope believe, does bring benefits, both cultural benefits, as I've described, but also economic benefits. Um, and one of the things that uh, the project we've been supporting has been doing has been supporting a traditional artisanal production, particularly around food, actually, production of local meats, um, but uh, jams and chutneys, um, and supporting uh, local producers to uh, maintain their traditional uh, ways of producing food and then marketing them uh, both nationally and internationally as high value um, products uh, based on traditional recipes and so on. So that part of the economy has been has been growing. But nevertheless, as I say, there's still some kind of tensions there and communication in restoration is absolutely critical uh, to engage people, to win their support so that they're really, you know, co-developers in the solutions um, that are needed for many of these areas. I mean, I quoted some figures right at the beginning about loss and some numbers. And I mean, my question would be to you, although they're quite dramatic, um, how many of you actually remember those figures that I mentioned just three or four minutes ago? Um, maybe your memories are better than mine, but when people quote figures to me, they're in one ear and out the other. Um, and I think one of the, um, the benefits, therefore, of, of art um, is that actually it now uh, enables things to stay within us. It creates um, memories and understanding that really go far beyond the kind of statistics that science often quotes at us. And it also allows an opportunity for people to engage and have conversations that science really actually cr often creates barriers rather than creates bridges between conservationists and the people they work with. Art, on the other hand, it allows a reflection uh, of uh, the past and also an opportunity for people to uh, reflect on the future and have visions of the future. I mean, that's very much part of what art, um, music, poetry, I think, is about, is about those uh, projections of, of hope. Um, so one of the things that we did um, quite early on within the programme was to introduce a programme for artists to work in residence um, with our projects. And the slides that I hope are being shown behind me are the results of um, some of that artwork from our different landscapes um, and some pictures of those kind of artists in residence in work. And you'll see it covers a complete range from musicians, composers to photographers, um, painters, um, and also kind of interactive um, performance artists as well. All of them working on that theme of um, uh, the environment, uh, social connection, um, projections of the future and loss, and so to begin those conversations. So Nico was um, the successful artist um, within the Carpathian Mountains, and you've seen uh, the results um, of, of her residency, which we think were fantastic to this extent, as I mentioned earlier, that she was awarded the prize as the, as the most successful, most outstanding artist we thought amounts all of those that we'd supported. Um, I mean, I think that's all I've got to say. So we haven't really rehearsed this, and I think we're kind of going backwards and forwards. And one of the things that on the way here in the taxi we discussed was maybe we would um, ask one another questions. Um, and um, so I'm going to now take this opportunity to ask Nico a few questions about her about her residency. Um, so I'm going to kick off. I mean, we've heard so much about Sylvia. Nico, and I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about what it was like working with Sylvia and about the kind of relationship that built up between you as the producer and Sylvia as the as the artist elder within the community. Yes, Sylvia became like my grandma, basically, and uh, quite quickly, and she started referring to us as we were all her grandchildren, which was really beautiful. Um, also, it's her birthday this year. She's going to be 80 in November. And she said that somehow God sent me in her life for the end of her life. This was one of the greatest things that happened to her. But also it was one of the greatest things that happened to me because um, I lost my mom during the making of this project and it was really hard. So 
doing this project, it was beautiful because he allowed me to make it as a homage to my mom and also to my grandma and um, all of those songs and stories that she talked about. There were songs and stories that were familiar to me. So I think, like we said, we healed each other. She healed me and I healed her. And I do hope that we'll continue. Thanks. So that's Sylvia, another kind of element that we've heard a little bit. I think it's kind of cropped up um, both a lot in your film, some of the images, um, but also the words are the, the beech trees. Um, so these, I think it sounds as though it's something that's kind of really important to you and maybe really important to the community. So maybe you could talk us about that. Tell us a little bit more about the connection between those those beech trees, what they mean to you and and what your understanding of is their meaning to to the community as well. 